Did you push the button? I did. Excellent. So, it's good to be here in Pennsylvania again. As was mentioned, me and my wife um, lived right around here for years. Graduated over at Valley Forge Christian College. So it's always a time of reminiscence and romance for us when we come back here and get in the hills of Pennsylvania again. So we're loving it. But um, my topic for you today is iconoclasm, the needed confrontation of the Christian with the culture. The needed confrontation of the Christian with the culture. And iconoclasm is the action of attacking or destroying idols, whether made of hands or created in the minds of men, the destruction of settled beliefs, institutions, values, or practices. An iconoclast is a person who attacks settled beliefs, institutions, values, or practices. Now, I use the word confrontation rather than conflict. If you've ever read Herbert Schlossberg's book, Idols for Destruction, which is an awesome work, and I've been, that's what I'm giving to all my sons and sons-in-law this year for their birthdays. They're each getting a copy of that book. Back then, it was called the confrontation between the Christian and the world. And um, now they've softened it up and all. We get nicer all the time and softer. Now it's the word conflict. But I like the word confrontation. It's not mere conflict. Confrontation is the clashing of forces or ideas. It's face to face. And we do a lot of ministry out at the university and I love it. And at the high schools. I like to talk to the people and be able to um, minister face to face. And it's amazing how the idols of our land destroy people's lives. Um, iconoclasm in history is most often associated with idols made with hands, whether wood, stone, or metal, such as silver or gold. Uh, one of my favorite stories is the story about Boniface, who in the 8th century became known as the Apostle to Germania. And what is now known as Erfurt, Germany, is the location that he came to to try to reach the Germanic peoples. All other missionary endeavors prior to that ended up unfruitful and it was considered quite dangerous to go to the Germanic people. After he had been there for several months, Boniface realized that they were all beholden to this oak of Thor. And so he decided to cut it down. So this is like a famous story in church history. He cut down the oak of Thor. They all waited for lightning to come out and strike him dead. It didn't happen. He preached the gospel to them and thousands upon thousands were converted to Christ. Everybody didn't know about Boniface, but what they don't know is about the guy who mentored him. That was a guy named Willibrord. Willibrord was about 18 years older than Boniface, so he was the older guy mentoring the younger guy, and Boniface was with Willibrord for a number of years before going to Germania, and when he was with Willibrord. Willibrord's style of evangelism was he'd come into a town, find what idols they worshipped, because most did, and he would smash them to pieces. And then he'd preach the gospel. <laughs> so, and I don't even want to begin the debates and talk <laughs> about all that, but needless to say, if it hadn't been, because most people didn't like old Willibrord, if it hadn't been for that influence in Boniface's life, Boniface probably never would have cut down the Oak of Thor and thousands won to Christ there in Germania. So that's an awesome story dealing with idols made with hands. Iconoclasm is known and often associated with idols made with hands, made out of gold, wood, silver, or stone. But iconoclasm not only involves the destructions of idols made with hands, but made with minds. And those are the types of idols that we have in America today. An idol is anything that men put in the place of God. An idol is anything that men put in the place of God. History has proven that as men reject the Bible, the God of the Bible, idols spring up across the land more and more. And one of these idols in our day is the state. I believe that is the idolatry of our age, our secular society is worship of the state. People in our nation routinely, in practice, give the state a place only due to God. 
They make the state God, and as such, honor the state with unlimited obedience, which is also an act of worship. Here in America now, as the people in our nation have rejected the Lord, the state has become messianic. All Americans bow down to the state, conform to whatever it says, look to it to wipe their butts and blow their noses from the cradle to the grave. Hegel spoke of the state as, quote-unquote, God marching on earth. And the tyrant emperor Diocletian declared the state, quote, the watchful parents of the whole human race, unquote. Both of these sound amazingly familiar, don't they, to our society today, not only here in America, but throughout the West. Most Christians would say, oh no, we do not view the state that way with their mouths, but their actions repeatedly make clear they have embraced Hegel with their hearts. They have embraced Diocletian with their hearts. Thomas Hobbes, who spit all over the law of God in the 17th century, as most all Christians have now in our day, spurned the law of God. And to attack the veracity of Scripture, in his monumental work, Leviathan, schooled Christians that they should obey the state no matter what it decrees. He stated, there can be there can therefore be no contradiction between the laws of God and the laws of a Christian commonwealth. He said this even though history is rife with examples where Christian commonwealths made laws that did contradict the law of God. Hobbes writes concerning the civil authority, he said this, quote, and because he is a sovereign, he requires obedience to all his own, that is, to all the civil laws, in which also are contained all the laws of nature, that is, all the laws of God. So to Hobbes, the laws of the state are the laws of God. So when Scotus declares that you can murder preborn babies, that is the law of God in Hobbes' worldview. And you should obey it and allow them to be murdered. You have no personal compunction to take action on their behalf or to call the magistrates to repentance. In fact, your indifference towards it all is actually a sign of your spirituality. That's where we're at in American Christianity. When Scotus says two men can marry, we should all just obey. The lesser magistrates, state and county officials have no duty to interpose. Rather, all are to go along because that's the law of God. In Leviathan, Hobbes wanted an all-encompassing state that was granted unquestioning obedience by the people, and of course this was for their good, as Hobbes makes clear repeatedly. For Hobbes, disobedience to the state is disobedience to the voice of God, and that is what we have in America today, a blithe unquestioning obedience to the civil government, particularly the federal judiciary. Only Christians can break this. Only Christians can break this madness in our land where everyone obeys the state. And the reason we can is because of our worldview. Here's a little thing I put together. Our view, worldview is made up of the nature of God, the nature of man, the nature of authority, the nature of truth, the nature of values, the nature of ethics. And, you know, you look under man, Christian, our Christian presupposition is that man is wicked, yet he's the crown of God's creation, whereas the pagan presupposition is man is basically good, but he's an animal, <laughs> you know. And when you look under authority, we view God as the final arbiter, whereas the pagan views man is the final arbiter. That's a huge difference. And that's the reason that we can break this. Because when we look at the three great governments of the earth, family, church, and state, we see that all three are under the authority of the Lord, under his sovereign rule. And therefore, they are to govern according to his rule. And if they don't govern according to his rule, they're acting outside the authority that's been delegated to them by God and should be resisted in the wrong that they're doing. That's massively important to understand. So we can break it with the Christian worldview. And as the lawlessness of the state increases, 
People who don't know Christ want to hear these things. And this has actually been the beginning point for numerous people I know now who have come to know Christ from learning about these things first. I've done literally hundreds of presentations on the Lesser Magistrate Doctrine, many of them to scores of political gatherings, and routinely I have people come up to me afterwards saying, I gave up on Christ and organized Christianity years ago, but after hearing you as a minister talk the way you did here today, I need to relook at all that. Because God's Word speaks to all matters of life, including the matters of civil government, the matters of tyranny, and how it can be resisted in a legitimate, biblical, proper fashion. Here today, I don't want to take you down a path of studying the history of iconoclasm. Rather, I want to talk to you about what I perceive as the greatest idol of our day. And you can debate me on that. We all have our lives, and we all have the things that we've been thrust into or we're focused on. But to me, this is a massive, to me it's insane that we live in a nation where the Supreme Court says it's okay to murder helpless preborn babies and everybody stands by and obeys. That is insanity. Where a Supreme Court says two men or two women can marry and everybody complies. That is insanity. And when I see God's law and word being impugned, as his representative, I, I can't help but speak out. This is wrong. It's evil. And so what I've learned in my efforts regarding interposition of the lesser magistrates is that this is the greatest idol that we encounter from the magistrates and from the people here in America. And that idol is called judicial supremacy. That is the biggest idol we have. We already have a nation schooled in generations of secular thought now who worship the state, are beholden to the state, and this is a massive branch of that state worship, judicial supremacy. So I'm going to go through here and show you that judicial supremacy is wrong. And then I want to talk to you about how it can be toppled. And I hope you understand how it needs to be toppled because you've all been told by a pro-life, pro-family representative at some point, well, the federal courts have ruled. All we can do is obey. All we can do is hope that one day Roe v. Wade is overturned. We've got to get the right number of justices, and then we'll pull it off. You've all heard that from your politicians, and it's all a complete lie. This idol advances three great fictions that have been pounded in the heads of Americans through government education, the news media, the politicians, the lawyers, and even the special interest groups, including the pro-life, pro-family groups. That's the idea that SCOTUS has a divine right. <laughs> I mean, we threw off this nonsense of the divine right of kings, you know, and we've replaced it now with the divine right of SCOTUS. The first fiction is that when SCOTUS issues an opinion, that is the law of the land. The second fiction Americans are taught is that SCOTUS is the final arbiter of what is constitutional and what is unconstitutional. And the third fiction Americans have been taught is that all other authorities in the nation must bow down to whatever SCOTUS says, even if they say something is irrational and immoral, as two men or two women must be allowed to be married. And yes, even if they say a helpless preborn child can be butchered in our midst, all others must bow down to them and do what they say. And this is all a great fiction. It is an utter lie. It is the idol in the minds of men. And that is why they stand by and watch. This idol must be toppled in the minds of men if we are going to see interposition affected by the lesser magistrates. This is inescapable. I hope you heard what I said. It's inescapable. Unless we topple this idol, we will never see interposition of the state magistrates in this nation. We must do away with this mentality that the federal courts have ruled. All we can do is obey. You cannot ignore this. You must expose it. Otherwise, Americans and their magistrates will continue to stand by while SCOTUS dispenses immorality and injustice. 
They will continue to just blithely obey, being played by the politicians and the special interest groups to keep vying for their Supreme Court justice to get in. And a complete absurdity. So let us expose the fiction. And let's deal with the first one listed here. When SCOTUS issues an opinion, that opinion is the law of the land. Absolutely false. After the Obergefell opinion that declared homosex marriage to be constitutional, in the fall of that year, October 2015, there was 72 legal scholars who issued a declaration declaring that Obergefell is not the law of the land. Okay, now these are prominent men, many of them um, scholars at major universities, actually hazarding their careers because as they put it in their, doc, in their declaration, all of Western civilization is at stake because of this attack. You understand the state is doing a designed attack against marriage and family for decades now. You know, the decriminalization of adultery, divorce for any reason or no reason at all, now homosexual marriage, and a list of other things. I could go on and on about how they've invaded our domestic affairs. I always tell people who I've counseled, I've counseled over 400 couples with marriage problems. When one of them starts talking about going to the government, you know, I'm like, once you do that, just so you know, it's the end of your marriage. Because this government doesn't repair marriages, it finishes them off. That's what the whole process is designed to do. It's wicked. So they've done everything they can, and this is their latest plank. It belittles, it demeans marriage and family. Article 1, Section 1 of the U.S. Constitution states that all legislative power is vested in Congress, which shall consist of a House of Representatives and a Senate. That's all it says. If all lawmaking power is vested in Congress, how much lawmaking power does that leave for the judiciary? That's right, I was terrible at math too, but even I get this. It means zero. They have no lawmaking power, according to the Constitution. It's vested in the legislature. This is why Justice Scalia wrote in his rebuttal of the Obergefell opinion that Obergefell, quote, is a naked judicial claim to legislative, indeed super legislative power, a claim fundamentally at odds with our system of government, unquote. He is saying what we are saying. A Obergefell is not the law of the land. So this is the first fiction that has to be done away with. The second part of the fiction, called judicial supremacy, is that the Supreme Court is the final arbiter of what is or isn't constitutional. The adherents of this belief, and there is a sea of lawyers in this country vested up to their eyeballs to keep this fiction in place, actually have the hubris to point to the Constitution itself and say that the Constitution declares the judiciary to be the final arbiter. And they point to Article 6, Paragraph 2. Article 6, Paragraph 2 of the Constitution known as the Supremacy Clause. And they say the Supremacy Clause makes it clear that the Supreme Court is the final arbiter of what is or isn't constitutional. And it's an utter lie. The Constitution was written so that the common man could understand it, not so you had to have a group of legal experts define it to you. You know, like the Church of Rome of old wanted them to be the experts to tell you what Scripture was plainly saying as they turned it on its head. The same thing here when it comes to the matters of law. That's what these guys have done. When you read Article 6, Paragraph 2, you can't help but notice that the Supreme Court is not mentioned anywhere. In fact, federal courts aren't mentioned anywhere. Do you know what has supremacy? It's the Constitution itself. That's what has the supremacy. That's an important point to understand. It's not the judiciary, it's not the Supreme Court. Wholly opposite of this view of judicial supremacy was the view held by America's founders. They viewed the judiciary as the weakest branch of the government. 
In a letter penned in 1823, for example, Thomas Jefferson stated, at the establishment of our constitutions, the judiciary bodies were supposed to be the most helpless and harmless members of the government. Experience, however, soon showed in what way they were to become the most dangerous. If you know anything about Thomas Jefferson, he spent the last 20 years of his life fighting with the judiciary because he saw what they were doing beginning at Marbury versus Madison and onward, that they were going to write themselves powers they were not granted in the Constitution to have. Alexander Hamilton, who was the most favorable to the judiciary and probably my most unfavorite founding father of America, wanting to allay the fears the other founders had of the judiciary stated this, quote, the judiciary from the nature of its functions will always be the least dangerous to the political rights of the Constitution because it will be the least in the capacity to annoy or injure them. This is what our founders established. Okay? Wholly opposite of where we're at today with judicial supremacy, where everybody bows down to SCOTUS. James Madison, known as the architect of the Constitution, stated the judiciary is beyond comparison the weakest of the three departments of power, he said. In Republican government, the legislative authority necessarily predominates. That's all been turned on its head now. Exact opposite of what was established 200 and some years ago. The judiciary is not the strongest. It does not write laws. It's not the final arbiter. Rather, as the founder stated, it's the most helpless, harmless, and weakest. All that's been turned. America has replaced a monarchy with an oligarchy. That's where we're at today with the federal judiciary. We now have social transformation without representation. Our founders never wanted that. We have representative government. Laws were made through our representatives in the legislature, not written by a handful of men. Jefferson warned of this 200 years ago. He wrote in a letter in 1820 to an early judicial supremacist. He said this, You seem to consider the judges as the ultimate arbiters of all constitutional questions, a very dangerous doctrine indeed, and one which would place us under the despotism of an oligarchy. He went on to say, the Constitution has erected no such single tribunal. There is no final arbiter of what is constitutional or unconstitutional. There is none. It has erected no such single tribunal, knowing that to whatever hands confided with the corruptions of time and power, its members would become despots. And we're living in what he wrote about 200 years ago. We're, we're in the midst of the storm. It's awful. In a true federalism, Every magistrate, from a policeman all the way up to the president who takes an oath to uphold this Constitution, gets to determine what is constitutional. And whenever one branch of government begins to play the tyrant and make law or policy or court opinion contrary to it, it's incumbent upon all those who took the oath to uphold that Constitution to resist that branch even if the branch is the Supreme Court of the United States itself. That's what was established here in our country. He stated in another letter, Jefferson did in 1821, he said, the germ of dissolution of our federal government is the constitution of the federal judiciary, an irresponsible body for impeachment is scarcely a scarecrow. Yeah, just read the history of how many federal judges have been impeached, none of them ever for rotten, filthy opinions being issued. Working like gravity by night and by day, gaining a little today and a little tomorrow, and advancing its noiseless step like a thief over the field of jurisdiction until all shall be usurped. They're here. They've been here for over 60 years. They, everybody bows down to them. They have usurped every other jurisdiction of authority in this nation. Everyone obeys them. And the judiciary has been doing that for 200 years, giving themselves powers never granted them in the Constitution, usurping all other government jurisdictions. Men will forbear, and so we should. But there comes a point where forbearance becomes sin. There comes a point where forbearance becomes cowardice. There comes a point when men realize they no longer have the 
convenience of acting indifferent towards the unjust or immoral actions of their government. And I submit to you that the lawlessness of the judiciary should not be forborne. I submit to you that they need to be defied and resisted. Senator Oliver Ellsworth, the primary drafter of Article 3 of the Constitution, which delineates the function of the judiciary, promised the people of his state before the Constitution was ratified that the judiciary was, quote, unquote, not to intermeddle with your internal policy. Now the federal beast has the compliance of every governor in America. Every governor in America bows down and bends over to the judiciary. They accommodate the murder of the preborn. They accommodate homosexual marriage. And they'll accommodate boys in the girls' shower rooms. You watch. They'll obey them no matter what. What people have to understand is SCOTUS does not write laws. They cannot write laws for Pennsylvania. They cannot write laws for Wisconsin. Only state legislators can write laws for those states. Yet all the executive is each state, the governors and attorney generals lie down and submit to a lawless judiciary, submit to their judicial thuggery. The states have actually spent the last 44 years writing law to accommodate the Supreme Court Roe opinion that the murder can be pre that the preborn can be murdered. That's what the pro-life movement has spent 44 years doing. You understand that? Writing laws to accommodate that opinion. There were no laws in their state that said you could murder the preborn. Every state now has laws that say you can murder the preborn while they're trying to regulate abortion in compliance with the Supreme Court's interpretation of the Constitution regarding Roe v. Wade. And now what's happening, all the states are doing that regarding marriage. This is like front and center in Wisconsin for us guys. We like we have we know magistrates there. I'll be talking about that in a little bit. Mission to the magistrates. Anything that comes up to change the laws of our state at the school level, you know, at policy level of any kind, we're on it. It is not changing. A, you guys didn't do your duty and just defy them to begin with which is your duty, you're not going to do what you did to the pre-born and write law in order to accommodate our state to that filth. So it's kind of put him in a pincher, <laughs> which is good. You know, some Christians, oh, well, he's such a nice guy, that my politician, and I hate to put him in such a tough spot. Are you serious? He knew what he was getting into when he joined, and if he didn't, he needs to get out. Politics is about confrontation, not accommodation. Their duty is not to accommodate or bow down, but to interpose. I want you to listen to the arrogance of the federal judiciary, because it is massive. Here's what Charles Evan Hughes, who served under the bulk of FDR's tenure as Chief Justice on the Supreme Court, stated. He said, we are under a constitution, but the constitution is what the Supreme Court says it is. That's, that's a voice of a tyrant. That's arrogance. And notice that this has all been done by the hand of both the Democrats and the Republicans. It hasn't been done by the Democrats and the Republicans. It hasn't been done by the Republicans and the Democrats. No, they've all gone through it. They've done it together. And that's because the problem is systemic. It's at the educational level for lawyers and what they're taught. The judiciary cannot be redeemed at this point without interposition by the other branches of government, the executive and the legislative. They must be defied. And I tell this to every magistrate I meet with. They have to be defied. You can't put up another law to send it to them. That game's been played for decades. You have to defy them. You have to interpose. It's massively important. And the thinking is building. It's awesome, let me tell you. It's awesome. So like my last three years, my New Year's resolution, resolution has been to foment rebellion against the lawless federal judiciary. It is so wicked. It is so evil. Here's what Harlan Stone, who was appointed by Republican Calvin Coolidge and nominated for Chief Justice by FDR, 
wrote in the United States versus Butler 1936 case, he said, the only check upon our own exercise of power is our own self-restraint. I'm only giving you a few quotes. There's volumes written on this. Just read the Obergefell opinion and what the dissenters wrote there about the arrogance of those five who went with the Obergefell opinion. Judge Richard Posner, appointed to the federal bench by President Reagan, stated this. He said, it's funny to talk about the oath judges take to uphold the Constitution since the Supreme Court has transformed the Constitution in its decisions. He openly says it. This is 2015. This is two years ago. This thinking has been going on for over a hundred years now. The oath is not really to the original Constitution or to the Constitution as amended. It is to some body of law created by the Supreme Court. You can forget about the oath. That is not of significance. They have rewritten the Constitution and all the other branches of government bow down to them. It's lawless. They need to be reined in. It is systemic, as I mentioned. If you do find a good statesman, like Judge Roy Moore, who stands for what's right and says what's needed, oh, all your fellow lawyers gang up on you, and you're removed from office as Chief Justice of your state. It's a systemic problem with the judiciary. They have to be defied. They are the tyrant. They're the ones with the fangs. I talked to a lawyer who I love and appreciate. I've met about nine of those in my entire life. Um, all the rest fit the bill for all the lawyer jokes. Um, but he told me, he said, our hands are tied. He said, as a lawyer, my hands are tied. I cannot do what needs to be done because of these courts. I'm a, I'm a agent of these courts, there's only so much I can do. The other branches of government have to do their duty and interpose and defy the judiciary. And he's right. The judiciary is tyrant. They are lawless. We're under the despotism and oligarchy. And this lawless authoritarianism of the federal courts must be broken. And it will only be broken by the interposition of the lesser magistrates. Congress is a weakling. They're worthless. They're going to do nothing. POTUS is usually as busy as SCOTUS doing unconstitutional things in the office that they hold. And so they're always vying for power between each other. They're the two ones totally acting outside the Constitution that need to be reined in. Nowhere does the Constitution bind us to a suicide pact with SCOTUS. I always put stars next to that. Nowhere does the Constitution bind us to a suicide pact with SCOTUS. They need to be defied. And this brings us to the third fiction of this great idol. The first is they don't make law. The second is they're not the final arbiter. And the third is all other branches of government must bow down to SCOTUS, and this too is an utter lie. They do not have to bow down to them. The truth is a true federalism understands that all magistrates, whatever their level or sphere of jurisdiction, possess lawful authority. And that whenever one branch of government begins to play the tyrant, all other branches, whether federal, state, county, or local, have the duty to oppose the branch acting tyrannically, even if that branch is SCOTUS. They all take an oath to uphold the Constitution from a policeman to the president. They don't take an oath of subservience to the federal government. They don't take an oath of obedience to immoral and unjust opinions of the federal court. They take an oath to uphold the Constitution. The Constitution is what's known as organic law to our nation. It's underneath God's law, <laughs> which is paramount. But organic law is above this, what they've done. Their duty is to that Constitution, not to these other bodies within government. So they have a duty to resist them for what they're doing. They do not take an oath to some body of law created by the Supreme Court, as Justice Posner states. As legal historian Alpheus Thomas Mason wrote 
not too long ago. He said, implicit in the system of government the framers designed is the basic premise that unchecked power in any hands whatsoever is intolerable. That's what our founders established. Understand? And now we see that the Supreme Court is unchecked, and they must be checked. Their duty, the magistrate's duty, is not to bow down. Their duty is to interpose. Interposition is an historic Christian doctrine, one which has played a prominent role in the development of government function in Western civilization. I have a book I've written on it, and I encourage you to avail yourself to it so you can learn about that doctrine if you don't know what I'm talking about. It's an important massive doctrine which simply states that when the higher ranking civil authority makes unjust or immoral law, policy, or court opinion, the lower or lesser ranking civil authority has both the right and the duty not to obey the higher authority and, if necessary, to actively resist the higher authority. Yesterday, my wife and uh, Matthew Marcotte and um, Joel Saint were over here at the place behind us here, that um, barbecue joint. Mission. Mission Barbecue. So we ate there. So the manager came up and he's talking with us and he's like, he just wouldn't leave. So I don't know about you, but I'm like, okay, so this is the reason this guy's hanging around us. I'm like looking for a door to start talking to him about something a little more meaningful than the weather. So. Um, he happens to mention that he uh, was a political science major. So I said, oh, there's my door. <laughs> so I, I, said, <laughs> I said, you know, I go to the universities quite often. I said, I meet all kinds of guys who their major is political science. And here's my question to you. It's the same to all of them. I said, what are you going to do with that major? <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, you know what? I don't know. I said, that's exactly what every guy I've asked said the same thing to me. I do not know. I said, well, I want you to know I wrote a book that was actually cataloged in the genre of political science. My book on the Doctrine of Lesser Magistrates and Magdeburg Confession that we translated um, is actually cataloged as political science in the category of political science. So we hit it off right away, ended up talking for what, like 35 minutes or something. He was all excited about this thing. And me and my wife, I'm like this all the time. My wife, if you're with her, she's a crazy evangelist type. You know, five minutes you know someone, she's bringing up abortion or homosex. <laughs> you know, you're just like, okay. Um, so, I mean, it cuts through everything. <laughs> truth, truth always cuts through everything. And so we're like, she gets me in all these conversations. I, I'm, I'm the guy who brings up, hey, have you ever heard of the Doctrine of the Lesser Magistrates? Nobody's ever heard of it. So we were at a little cafe a couple weeks ago. Two cops sit down next to us. We're outside. I let them settle in, and after they were all set in, I go, hey, how's it going? And they go, it's going good. I go, have you guys ever heard of the Doctrine of the Lesser Magistrates? <laughs> <laughs> so we end up in this long conversation. In the end, the one cop says to me, he says, so why are you talking to us about this? I said, because one day there may come a time where your governor says something totally opposite of what this federal government says, and you're going to have to decide who you obey. And they were like... They got it. Yeah, this stuff has practical implications in the real world, especially the world we live in this day. So, anyways, um, let me continue on here. Our founders expected interposition by the states if the federal government acted outside their constitutional restraints. And it didn't take the federal government long to get outside their constitutional restraints. Just 11 years afterwards, two states defied them over the Alien Sedition Act, and that was Virginia and Kentucky. And the guy who wrote the Virginia Resolution was James Madison. Again, James Madison, the architect of the Constitution, and later a president. And he said in part, you should read the whole thing, the Virginia Resolutions, when you get a chance. He said the states that are parties there too parties to the U.S. Constitution have the right and are in duty bound to interpose for arresting the progress of evil. He went on to say, and for maintaining within their respective limits the authorities' rights and liberties appertaining to them. And that's something I tell to our state magistrates every time I meet with them. 
We're instructing them from the Word of God, and we're instructing them regarding the melu we live in, what was given to us lawfully within this country, what was founded. And I point out to them, you have a duty to defend this state's authority. You have a duty to defend our liberties. You have to call people to virtue and to right standing. I always tell them, my prayer is that you'll do right by him. Thomas Jefferson wrote the um, Kentucky Resolution, and he said, in part, and that whensoever the general government, talking about the federal government, assumes undelegated powers, its acts are unauthoritative, void, and of no force. See, this doctrine can need application in any form of government, not just in a you know, dictatorship or a monarchy or a democracy, but even in a constitutional republic this doctrine of interposition, the interposition of lesser magistrates, can need application. Why? Because of the nature of man. Man is wicked. He can corrupt any form of government. I always tell young people that. There is no perfect form of government. There is none. Because any form of government can be corrupted. Anyone can be. There's some that are better than others, but they can all be corrupted. And that's just a fact. The tyrant is the judiciary, and sadly its tyranny is aided and embedded by pro-life, pro-family organizations and by the magistrates themselves. For example, when you respond to abortion politically within the framework of Roe, you're giving credence to the tyrant. You're going to the tyrant with your hat out, you're accepting the parameters and framework of their tyranny, you are trying to get scraps from a thug. The pro-life, pro-family groups give cover to the pro-life politicians, and the pro-life politicians give cover to the pro-life, pro-family groups. One get votes, the other get money. And they like the cozy arrangement they've created for each other, and I've spoken out over and over against it, because I've been involved in this fight for three decades, and it's evil to watch how these people win political power or money in their coffers off the bloody backs of the innocent preborn. Everyone benefits off their cozy relationship except the ones they claim to want to defend and protect, the preborn. They're the only ones who get nothing out of their cozy arrangement. When pro-lifers, conservatives, and Republicans wail for the importance of the vote for president based upon who gets to appoint the Supreme Court justices, they are aiding and abetting this great fiction of judicial supremacy. I don't do that. I refuse to do that. I've written articles exposing the fact that we've been played for decades by the Republicans, claiming that we need to get them elected so they can put the justices on, and yet Roe v. Wade, it's too important a political football for them to let stop. They've had the majority, for 34 years they had the majority. The Republicans did either 7 to 2 or 8 to 1. And yet Roe v. Wade, and numerous changes of justices, and yet Roe v. Wade still in place. When the magistrates and the pro-family groups hide behind the lie, the Supreme Court has ruled, all we can do is obey, they are telling you a lie, and they are aiding and abetting the injustice of Roe. They claim to be against the killing, while they don't stop the killing, interposition is what stops the killing. Understand, tyrants cannot be appeased, mark that down, they must be confronted. You cannot appease tyrants. You confront tyrants. That's how it is from the time you're a kid out on the school playground. And it's the same in the big world. We must break the cabal that these people have created for themselves. So many worry, what will the federal beast do if we act on behalf of the preborn? That's the biggest thing I get from the lesser magistrates. Well, what will, the, what will they do? I always tell them, let me tell you what will happen if good men do not take a stand and confront the tyrant. You accommodate the tyrant so he can move on to constructing the next plank of his tyranny. And that's exactly what this federal government has been doing for decades now. If good men don't confront the tyrant, hazard their lives, willing to sacrifice, they give the tyrant the convenience of not having to come out of his lair and show his fangs and expose himself. 
It's a needed part of the process. The situation demands the interposition of good men. The 72 scholars I mentioned earlier who pointed out that Obergefell is not the law of the land, in their declaration went on to call upon all officials, state officials, to defy the federal judiciary, to not go along with this ruling. The judiciary is the tool of the left, and there's a whole history on this. I've read, I'm on my eighth book dealing with judicial supremacy right now. I have ten to read. Pro judicial supremacy, anti judicial supremacy, two books just dealing with the history of the judiciary. I always teach my kids you want to say you know anything about something, you got to read a dozen books on it from all different persuasions to say you know something about it, to be well schooled. The judiciary is the tool the left uses a hammer to get what they want. A hundred years ago, it was the left who was getting hammered by the judiciary. They saw their opportunity, they moved in to take the judiciary over. And they've made it way more than what it was before in its power. What they can't get through representative government, they get through the judiciary. They've been doing it for decades. They want social transformation without representation. All we have abided with their fiction, and this must end. Now listen to me. You must not ignore what I'm telling you here. You must expose the fiction of judicial supremacy if you're going to affect interposition against federal judicial lawlessness. You must topple this idol in the minds of men, the people and the magistrates. Exposing this fiction goes hand in glove with interposition. You must attack this fiction in your speeches, in your gatherings, in your literature, in your articles, in your videos you make, in your memes. And don't think that you need the majority to understand these things or believe. You know what the majority will always want? You know what they always care about from till they die? They only care about three things, the vast majority. Me, myself, and I. The world never really knew they were here, and the world doesn't miss them when they're gone. It's a stated fact that the people who care about public policy matters, whether for good or for evil, never amount to more than 15%. And being 56 years old now, I can tell you, yeah, anecdotally, no doubt about it. And that's probably really high. 3%, and you can change public policy. 3%. That's the indifference that we have. You want the church to help you out? The church in America is a whore. The pulpits are whores. I've met with them for years, sat down, talked with them, sat in their parking lots weeping afterwards while they give me their theological treatises while they're spirit, why they're spiritual to do nothing for their pre-born neighbor in need. It is heartbreaking. It is grievous. I quit meeting with them because I can't handle it. I can't. I'm too old now. I let the young guys do that. <laughs> they do a pretty good job, too, meeting with them. I haven't rejected the church, just so you know. I just can't deal with it in that area, so I write. I've written articles on pietism. I view it as the problem within American Christianity. If you go to our website, uh, defytyrants.com, we have a whole section on pietism. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it was a movement from the 17th century that is still here today, and it's awful. So I have like three short articles and two short videos that you can watch that explain it thoroughly. And I've actually been contacted, I'm not kidding you, by hundreds and hundreds of people around the country who knew there was something messed up with American Christianity. And when they've either read these little articles or watched the little videos, they're like, it put my finger on where we're at. And these, I'm talking about these are deep theological matters. And they've created all kinds of little slogans the pietists have to neutralize the Christians from the public realm. You know, like... We should just preach the gospel. Or, I just expect sinners to act like sinners. We should just pray. You know, all these little things that are bogus and should not be tolerated. So I respond to each of those in real short, succinct fashion, because that's important nowadays. <laughs> People have to know what they are doing is right. Exposing this fiction shows them they are right when it comes to interposition. People read my book. My book sold over 20,000 copies now. And it's like crazy. And um, I was talking to a guy. 
He does publishing for big name conservative guys. They say when, when we sell 10,000, that's good. So people don't read. Over 20,000 copies have sold. And people keep, okay, I love this. It puts fire in their heart for righteousness and for the Lord. But how does it flesh out in our present day? I'm talking to you about that right now. This is part of it. They have to understand the fiction of judicial supremacy in order to see clear that they have the right, they have the duty to interpose against a lawless federal judiciary. Extremely important. There's a war against Christ in this nation and it is being waged by our own federal government. They are at war with Christ and they are at war with the family. The greatest threat to our nation, to our family, is not ISIS, it's not Russia, it's our own federal government. Through law, policy, and court opinions, they have weakened the family. They have belittled and demeaned the institution of marriage and family through law, policy, and court opinion. This has been done by design. Why? Because every good status knows that in order to strengthen the state, you have to weaken the family. So I like, me and my wife, we love each other. We've been together for 35 years now. We have four, uh, 15 grandkids now. We have 11 children. We have a lot invested in the future. And so family is massively important. Everything in this culture is against family. Most churches have bought into the idea of family within this culture. They don't even know what it is. They're living in a hologram world. And the government, they're at war with the family. They want you to fail. They want you to not see. They're not going to help you in your family virtues as a man, as a woman, as a husband, as a father. How many of you ever read Family and Civilization by Carl Zimmerman? It's like a massively important book to read. Mark it down. He wrote it in 1947. He was a sociologist. What's that? Family and Civilization by Carl Zimmerman. And he has an E on the last part of his name, Carl. Um, he was a sociologist, impeccable credentials. If you know anything about sociology, they do one of two things with Christianity. They either pretend that Christianity had everything bad to do with Western civilization for the last 2,000 years, or Christianity had nothing to do with Western civilization for 2,000 years. I personally love reading sociology. So, I know this firsthand. And, well, Carl Zimmerman was a renowned sociologist but he was just an honest guy. And so he actually talked about much of the good that Christianity brought to Western civilization over 2,000 years. And they hated him for it. In 1947, he said that America would soon see divorce for any reason or no reason at all. No fault divorce, late 60s, early 70s. He said we would soon see legalized abortion, 1973, and that we would soon see rampant homosexuality in the culture. Need I say more? He said this in 1947, and people said he was crazy. He based his, his prognostication upon his studies of the Greek and Roman civilizations and upon the French and Bolshevik revolutions and other smaller groups and societies. And he said this is the tipping point where we begin to see the destruction of a civilization or a society or a culture at any level. He said it's when the people no longer want to have children. And he said, I don't mean by that zero. He said, although there are those. He said, what I mean by that is they only want to have one or two. And he said, the reason that that is the case, that's the beginning of the end for any culture or civilization, he said is because when men want to be husbands and fathers and women want to be wives and mothers, it produces within people virtue. But when men don't want to be husbands and fathers, and women don't want to be wives and mothers, it produces within people vice. America has already been 150 years sliding down in how many children we have. The last three years, we don't even replace ourselves. Last year was 1.88. You need 2.1, according to demographers, to replace yourself. Most of Western Europe, they're all committing familial suicide also. 1.3, 1.2, they're, they're dying. You read the obituary, great grandpa, guy's 80 some years old, had his two kids, they had their two kids, and they had their one kid. Five descendants, and you're 80 years old? How's that even possible? 
is because people don't want to have children. And as Zimmerman pointed out, the reason people don't want to have children is because of their pursuit of wealth and ease. It took the Greeks 150 years from the time they didn't want to have kids till they fell to the Romans. It took the Romans nearly 400 years from the time they didn't want to have kids till they fell to the Germanic hordes. America's 150 years into our descent. I always tell people, family government, hold it dear to your heart. All this other insanity with church government, with state government, it's crazy, right? And you look at the state of the church, you look at the state of the state, <laughs> you're just like, wow, what? If there's a place you want to have some sanity, it's in your home. <laughs> you know? It's with your closest people, your loved ones. So it's important. Why are the states acting like they are at the mercy of the judiciary? What is the constitutional authority for a power so awesome as being the final arbiter? Listen, there is no such thing as a final arbiter in a true federalism. And when divine law is impugned, they are to be resisted, not obligated. Not obliged, I mean. I always got to throw in some Knox quotes. We have heroes in our home. Uh, the Swamp Fox, Francis Marion's one of them. We're big on military history in our house. And um, I mean, we love military history. And we're also big on church history. So like, Francis Marion's a big hero in our home. Um, Patrick Henry. And then this guy, John Knox. Like, huge. In the Chuella house. He said, You shall be excused if shall you be excused if with silence you pass over his iniquity, talking about the king's iniquity. Be not deceived, my lords, you are placed in authority for another purpose than to flatter your king and his folly and by range. He went on to say this for now the common song of all men is we must obey our kings, be they good or be they bad, for God is so commanded. True it is, God has commanded kings to be obeyed, but likewise true it is that in things which they commit against his glory, he has commanded no obedience. And that is the standard of Christian, Christianity. If the state demands that which God forbids, or forbids that which God commands, we're to obey God rather than man. The pietists have tried to reduce it to, well, only if we have to sin personally. That is not the standard. That's a pietist standard. The Christian standard is if they command that which God forbids or forbids that which God commands, we obey God rather than man. Let me ask you this. Did Corey Tembum have to mistreat Jews? Did she have to throw them into a death, uh, a death camp? No, but she still helped them, didn't she? She still helped. The abolitionists of old regarding slavery. Did they have to own a slave? Did they have to kill a slave? Did they mistreat a slave? No, but they still helped slaves. And those who blockaded the doors of abortion clinics 25 years ago here in America, did anybody tell them they had to kill their unborn child? No. But they still interposed. They obeyed God rather than man. They weren't asked to personally sin, but they still obeyed God rather than man because they saw what the magistrates were doing was wrong and unjust. Knox was radical. Let a thing here be noted that the prophet of God sometimes may teach treason against kings, yet neither he nor such as obey the words spoken in the Lord's name by him offend God. Important stuff. Let me brag on my state for a second. Um, this happened in 1859. Our legislature declared the Federal Fugitive Slave Act to be null, void, and of no authority in the state of Wisconsin. Does that sound strangely f similar to the Virginia Resolution? of 1798 that I showed you earlier. Well, here's what they went on to say as part of their resolves. Resolved that the government formed by the Constitution of the United States was not the exclusive or final judge of the extent of the powers delegated to itself, but that as in all other cases of compact, and that's what the Constitution is, a compact of the various states and the federal government, among parties having no common judge, each party has an equal right to judge for itself. Yeah, you know, I live in Wisconsin. I stick that in front of the magistrates all the time. <laughs> it's like, this is your duty. This is, I, I uh, just was reading this on the way out here. Um, Judge Roy Moore sent me this book, his little thing on abuse of power. And um, he states this from our Supreme Just, our, our Justice Abram Smith, who wrote the. Because our, also our Supreme Court defied SCOTUS, 
regarding the Federal Fugitive Slave Act. And um, not only did our legislators, but also our Supreme Court. And he said this, here's what Abram Smith, just as Abram Smith says, quote, quote, the duty of the states to watch closely and resist firmly every encroachment of the federal government becomes every day more and more imperative and the official oath of the functionaries of the states becomes more and more significant. Here's a man who understood everything I've been telling you about. He went on to say this, but believing as I do that every state officer who is required to take an oath to support the Constitution of the United States as well as of his own state was designedly placed by the federal Constitution as a sentinel to guard the outposts as well as the citadel of the great principles and rights which it was intended to declare, secure, and perpetuate, I cannot think, I cannot shrink from the discharge of the duty now devolved upon me. It actually came to him. You know, they, they broke Joshua Glover out of jail. A crowd of 5,000 people broke a, a, a slave who had been arrested by federal marshals out of jail in our city. This is how all this came about within our judiciary in our state. I know well its consequences and appreciate fully the criticism to which I may be subjected, but I believe most sincerely and solemnly that the last hope of free, representative, and responsible government rests upon the state sovereignties and fidelity of state officers to their double allegiance to the state and federal government, and so believing I cannot hesitate in performing a clear and indispensable duty. It was the duty of interposition that he's speaking of. He defied the federal judiciary. You do understand, slavery was recognized in our Constitution. When it comes to the killing of the preborn, we're dealing with a mere court opinion, and everyone's bowing down. And this is what I always say. I don't care what any statute of man says, what any court opinion of man says, what any constitution written by men says. If it's contrary to the law or word of God, it is void on its face and should not be obeyed. How many of you ever heard of Sir John Eliot and the Five Knights? How many of you ever read The Tyrannicide Brief? There's another great book to write down, The Tyrannicide Brief. If you like the Puritans, you'll love the Puritans after you read this book. It's all about John Cook, who was just a blue-collar guy who ended up being the prosecutor of Charles I when they lobbed his head off. The book is unbelievable, the sacrifice that these men made, because it all turned back on their heads ten years later when his son came back to power, King Charles' son, and butchered them draw and quarter. If you, you've never read what they do when they draw and quarter you, I won't do it because we're a mixed company here. Chilling. What they, would, what they had to endure. Well, before the Civil War in England ever started, there was Sir John Eliot and these five knights in 1629, and they defied um, the king. And he put them in the tower. All of these knights, their forefathers, were at Runnymede and signed the Magna Carta. They held their liberties, not cheaply, but they cherished them. John Eliot died while he was in prison. They spent three years in prison, the other men. But it was because of their sacrifice that it rallied the hearts of men that they threw off the tyranny of Charles I 10 years later. People have to be willing to sacrifice. I always remember the Gulag Archipelago, you know, by Solzhenitsyn. You know, I give that to my kids to read, and they're like, what? <laughs> He's like, massive, right? Yeah, well, okay. <laughs> Just read these parts. And he's, I always remember that one quote he had when he was talking about it. Everybody would go along to get along and would just keep their mouth shut while they knew neighbors were being taken away. They'd never see him again. And he said, every man always has handy a dozen glib little reasons why he is right not to sacrifice himself. And that's all too prevalent when tyranny raises its ugly head. There's so much more I could say. Another great book you want to read? Libido Dominandi, Poli um, Sexual License and Political Control. <laughs> Fantastic, well documented. His whole premise is he shows how governments have propensity to legalize licentiousness, sexual depravities, 
because they found that a more sexually licentious people is a more easily controlled people politically. Say that title again. Libido dominandi. Yep. Sexual license and political control. Phenomenal work. It's about this thick. Listen, just read the first 120 pages because everything after that, just the years and the, and the location changes. The premise is all the same through. Just keep the rest for a great reference work. It's a phenomenal work. Um, what else did I have to say? Okay, did I go over my time? And are you guys tired? Do you want to go to questions and answers or should I just buzz through this real quick? Okay, how to destroy this idol. I'll be real quick with this. Um, if I can find my notes. So how to destroy the idol. Okay, so here's what we do. We, um, all we do is we go down to the local coffee shop, order a latte, talk about it for a few hours, make a couple postings on Facebook, and it all works out. <laughs> okay. So. That's a relief. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's all right. That's about the depth, <laughs> you know, that we have this, uh, these days. No, this is like trench warfare. Rooting this out is going to be incredibly difficult to do. Um, because remember, an iconoclast is a person who attacks settled beliefs, institutions, values, or practices. And this one's huge, deeply embedded in our culture, that we should all just bow down to SCOTUS. So there are no silver bullets to topple this idol. I encourage you to get my sermon called Trench Warfare. I have um, guerrilla warfare out on the table. You can take that. It's free with you and listen to it. But then go to our website and listen to Trench Warfare. This is the part people don't like to do. And I'm going to talk about this um, last. Develop a mission to the magistrates in your own life. And I, I'll tell you, since I've done it, it's so rewarding and so awesome. I can tell you so many stories meeting with these men and these women. But... At times, I just get tired of it. You know, like, I just want to, I don't want to do that no more. You know, I just, yeah, I got other things I want to do. And what keeps me on course is my love for him and my love for my neighbor. And I remember, this is why I'm doing this. That's why I'm going through this monotony. At times, it can be, feel like monotony. And, of course, you have no guarantee that it's going to work in the end. But it has to be done. But here's, here's um, let's start with number two first. Expose the lie so the magistrates can no longer hide behind it. They know it's a lie. Many of them. I've talked with them. My own governor. He knows it's a lie. But he knows nobody's going to support him if he defies the federal government. He's totally convinced of that. Why? Because, A, one of the things I run into the magistrates over and over again is they never meet Christians and they never meet pastors. Ever. <laughs> I can tell you... And they all talk about it, and they're like stunned that you as a minister are sitting in their office talking to them, or at the local restaurant, wherever you may be. And it means something to them. We've met some good men along the way who are so glad to see us and want to hear what God has to say regarding their office as magistrates. So, anyways, you have to expose the lie so the magistrates can no longer hide behind it. I tell all the pro-life, pro-family groups this. Okay, this is a lie. I teach it to them, and they don't change. No, they hate Matuella, and they tell stories about him and make up lies in order to lower your reputation amongst, good, amongst the people at Capitol Hill and all that kind of stuff. Doesn't matter. Most people have enough sense. They meet me. They see, oh, okay, he's not this crazy person that they've made him out to be. And they see that we have sound reasons for why we believe what we believe. And so we've been able to... Everything they've done so far, thank God, has been like water on a duck's back. It just rolls off. And we just continue forward. And we've, we've got some good men. And our legislature ready to fight. So be, be praying for us. But we view it as a mission to the magistrates. They are forgotten by the Christian church. The magistrate will tell you, wicked people come into my office all day trying to get what they want. I never see the Christian people. Ever. And a pastor, 
unheard of. They'll routinely tell me, just like Tim was talking about, 200 churches in his county, only two of them care anything about public policy matters. Yeah, that's routinely what I hear from them. They'll have one pastor, two pastors in their whole jurisdiction that care about public policy. All the rest, they could care less. No interest whatsoever. It's sad to see. Your duty, the duty of the people, is to expose this lie so the magistrates can no longer hide behind it. You must assure the magistrates both publicly and privately, if they do interpose, that you are with them. You must give of your substance, of your very person, of your prayers to them. Publicly and privately, they have to know you're with them because they are hazarding their lives when they take a, take a stand, when they interpose. Another thing that's massively important is to instruct the general populace and the magistrates regarding the doctrines of interposition in the lesser magistrate. This is huge. It's important to do. And it's easy to do. The last thing I have is um, Bill of Abolition through Interposition. Since the book came out on the Doctrine of Lesser Magistrates, we are seeing something this year that we've never seen before. Um, this group, even though they're not a group, um, abolish human abortion. When I saw their rhetoric, I was like, this is good. And I got into many squabbles with many people. And um, I said, this is good, this is right. And so I called up Russell Hunter and I said, hey, I've written a book and this book is like, what you're talking and what this book teaches goes hand in glove. And so I sent it off to him. He didn't read it for five months, I did the same thing. Five months later he calls me up all on fire. Oh my gosh, this is great. <laughs> you know, all this kind of stuff. So last, this year, Ten states have already introduced bills of abolition, just to outlaw abortion, to interpose, to defy the federal judiciary. Right. State of Wisconsin hopes to be number 11 later this year. Right. This, is, this was never... When I used to talk to people about these types of things 15, 20 years ago, glazed looks. Things have devolved enough now that people realize we got a problem. And so they're listening to the teachings and they see the goodness of the doctrine, that it's founded in Scripture, that it's been employed by men down through history for thousands of years to reign in the tyranny of the higher authority and to do so often bloodlessly, which is important. So, we go with them. We can show you our little packet if you ever want. I was supposed to bring one and I forgot. We have a little packet, make it real easy for the magistrates, and we stay in communication with them. It's just something I've slated into my life, you know, that you have to have relationship with them, the magistrates. If we can find a governor and an attorney general willing to interpose at the executive branch, phenomenal. There is no governor in America that will interpose right now. None. From writing that book, I've been invited to talk to 11 different legislatures, to governor's men, to lieutenant governors, to attorney generals, to sheriffs, sheriff's organizations, uh, law enforcement. It's unbelievable. And the book's gone far and wide. This one brother who's here from Africa is telling me how he's using the book on the Doctrine of Lesser Magistrates to, as one of his teach, teaching tools to a group of young men in a squalor camp. Wow. It's phenomenal. So, people see the goodness of it and to me, it points people back to Christ. It points them back to Him and His rule. So, I, I, It's just phenomenal. Here's what Schlossberg said. He said, In a society in which idolatry runs rampant, a church that is not iconoclastic is a travesty. If it is not against the idols, it is with them. Well said. And that's my presentation to you. Thanks. Thank you.
So we'll take a few minutes if you do have any questions. Um, I know I rambled on somewhat, and um, I will repeat the questions. Sure. I was interested if you would comment. Uh, I, I understand basically what the doctrine of the lesser magistrate is, but I have a lot to learn about it. And I've actually already purchased your book and look forward to reading it. Awesome. Um, but I was wondering if you would comment on the biblical story of uh, Phineas and Zimri and Cosby. Um, and then in relation to that, maybe, um, I'm sure you're aware of who Paul Hill is. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'll let you share the stories if you want to, but I'd be interested in hearing your perspective on those two in relation to each other. Sure. Well, I'm very Knoxian in my views. So Knox believed you didn't have to have a lesser magistrate, that you want lesser magistrates. He clearly taught that that the magistrates have a duty for interposition and you can see the goodness of it. Um, because the higher authority always banks on the compliance of the lesser authorities in order to get their tyranny and evil down into the fabric of society. And when they don't have that, that's when the tyrant knows he has a problem on his hands. So like if a hundred of us or several hundred of us show up on a corner and say, we're not gonna take it anymore, you know, with our shotguns or whatever. And yeah. This federal government, they'll make quick work of that in no time at all. But when the lesser magistrates do their duty and stand in interposition against their lawlessness, that's when the tyrant authority knows they have a problem on their hands. They know that there's a chance of success, that, that the lesser magistrates may be successful in stopping this. So Knox believed we needed the um, magistrates, which I do. But he also believed that there could come a point where the people themselves have to do it. And he even cited this example of Phineas um, in order to stand against the tyranny of, um, of tyrants. So, um, and I agree with that. Because to me, at that point, it comes back to our homes. You, know, you, you don't want things to get to that point, first off. Let me say that. You don't. You don't want it to be where, because that's always bloody. That is always bloody. And that's one of the goodnesses of the doctrine of the lesser magistrate is you can stop the tyranny bloodlessly without major upheaval within the culture. And that type of thing, you can get them back into their lawful authority. So they're no longer acting outside it. And um, so, but if it did get to that point where things were that dire, that awful, then it, it reaches the point of family government. And this is where men have, down through the ages, coalesced at times in defiance of tyranny in order to do that. Even our founding fathers you know, used that to some extent. They, did, they were men who possessed lawful authority to begin with. You know, Patrick Henry, for example, was in the House of Burgesses there in Virginia. And they, as magistrates, interposed and defied Britain for their tyranny. Um, but there does come a time, I believe, where it is just for, um, under family government, for men to coalesce in order to defend against a tyrant that has become that rabid and that lawless. And so I'm, I agree with Knox on that matter. Anybody else? I don't know if you've ever heard that Roe was a liar there. That's to having lied later on. Oh, right. Exactly. Yep. No, those are like... Oh, repeat the question. Yes, did, did I repeat the first question? No, but it was... <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, and I said I would right before you <laughs> asked this question. Um, so, he was making more of a statement than a question. And um, his statement was is that um, Roe, uh, Norman McCorvey, lied about this about the um, law, but that doesn't matter anyways because it shouldn't change the law anyways, and he's right. <laughs> the laws of the state shouldn't be changed just because of a Supreme Court opinion. Yes? How do we get meetings with senators, state senators, state representatives, govern governors, those types of people? Excellent question. How do you get meetings with state senators, governors, um, se um, assemblymen, those types of folk? Um, getting a meeting with the governor is very hard, very difficult. Or it can be very easy. Like just this last Tuesday, 
at our Independence Day parade, our governor was walking through, and my 10-year-old daughter ran up and gave him a piece of our literature. <laughs> so, <laughs> and we've already written to him, and we have um, someone who tells us stuff on the inside. And yeah, our teaching's all over the place. And this thinking is there. And um, so, but he still won't meet with it. We haven't had a meeting with him. We haven't been able to get a meeting with him. Getting a meeting with the Attorney General, very doable. I'll just call the office, follow the procedure that they say. If you, you should still try to meet with the governor's men. And we've done that. That's very important to do. So you don't get to meet with the governor himself, but you get to meet with the men who are closest to him, his closest counselors. Very important. When it, yes, hon. When you visit the Capitol, you know, there's a front desk, and there's usually a chart where all your representatives are in the office, so you can just walk in there anytime because they're going to want to talk with them yep. about, you know, let's say you want to talk about the principles of God's law, and then you want to raise a standard to them, what ideally you might have for, you know, your family and your culture, and as a patriot and a saint, as a Christian, you, you know, you can write it down. And then you can come up with an idea of action that you would want them to take. And, you know, you can just share with you that you're willing to support them. And, yeah. Um, so what we're doing... Yeah, what we're doing right now is a bill of abolition. We're using that as their action point. We're putting that on their radar screen and um, instructing them in that matter. But uh, yeah, all you have to do is call them up. They will meet with you. Even if you're not in their district, they'll meet with you. Um, but here's a good thing. If you know someone who knows them and they give you an introduction or come with you to the meeting, all the better because that gives you credibility in their minds before you even arrive and you don't have to establish that during a 15 to, you get 15 to 20 minutes usually is what's cordial to ask for. Some of the guys get into it, they don't have another meeting, you'll sit there for an hour and a half. Um, but usually it's kept right about 20 minutes. And we don't just go once, we've been there many times already and we let different people go and we bring people with us who haven't done it before, so they can learn what we do. They can watch and see. It's just like family worship. I always have men tell me, oh, family worship, I don't do it. It seems like it's really a big deal. I go, no, nah, it's like a really simple deal, but it's an important deal. And if you just see someone do family worship, it's 10 minutes, 15 minutes in your home. It's like, that's it. Yep, that's it. <laughs> but yet it's so important for the cohesion of the family and building up in the faith and all that. It's more of a request. I would like to see an actual um, like role play of that. Mm -hmm. Maybe someday you could like, just get like, a camera and sit like, two people down. Because I think other people would like to see how this thing kind of goes down because I can't go to Wisconsin with you. Sure. Yeah, I mean, unless you would me out. <laughs> no, that's a good idea. We could do that. representatives are in session you know, in your capital, like Wisconsin, it's Madison. You know, you drive to your capital, you get to figure out when are these guys talking about, you know, on the topics, on matters that you want to address. And you're invited. You can go in there and you can sit in on these talks and you can, they'll pass out papers and you can sign in on the paper that you want to get up there and that you want to talk. My husband did a very good yeah, I did, I did a talk against recently against the Article 5, which Wisconsin's trying to be a part of the Article 5 convention, which I'm totally opposed to. But not opposed to it on most people's understanding of why they're opposed to it. And it was like a bomb going off in the place. I had three minutes and just blasted away. My whole point is they're, they're establishing this Article 5 convention to rein in the spending of Congress. That's supposedly why. And I'm just like... You guys aid and abet the spending of Congress. You take every dime that they'll give you, and yet you're trying. I said, you're busy acting like you're doing something while you're doing nothing. And um, I told them their duty isn't to is to not take the money and to interpose against you know unconstitutional acts by the federal government. That thing actually, I did interviews from coast to coast on radio stations. And um, that crazy, they actually video you while you're doing it. I didn't even know I was being videoed. I always tried to do better. <laughs> and, uh, 
And so it's like, so, but that like, and so public hearings is very good to speak at because it means something to the other legislators. But don't let them use you as their priest. Like I have some magistrates, you know, they call me, they want me to testify at a public hearing and I won't do it because most of their bills they want to pass, I don't agree with. I'm opposed to them. And I explain to them why I'm opposed to them. Because, you know, we know each other and I can share with them why I won't come and testify on behalf of their bill. So they know, you know, you're a man of integrity, you're not going to get played, and you're not going to rub their back so they'll rub your back. Because that's not what we're about, you know. So, yep. Do you do anything to train others on what you're doing? Yeah, well, like we... Um, earlier this year we took a huge group like 60 some people over there and just had them go in and we have this nice booklet that we've made that's real short and it's full of graphics made by a young guy like if I, gave, if I made it it'd be like the most boring thing on the planet nobody would look at it like 99% of the stuff they get there at their offices this thing is awesome and we've had so many magistrates and their, and their staff tell us it's like unbelievable you know <laughs> and um so we took people over there just to go in and say, here we'd like the um, legislator to read this, and we want them to interpose against Roe v. Wade, defy the federal judiciary, and defend the preborn here in the state of Wisconsin, uphold our state statutes against this slaughter. And that right there, they're going in, they're doing that. Most of the people we're given about five offices each to go to because we wanted them to go to let them get hit by different people and let the people get different experiences. Just doing that, you know how big that is to people? Because people are intimidated and they're scared and they're totally outside their element, but they feel emboldened when they're with a big group and there's four or five of them going into each office. And um, so it was a great experience for them. Lights up hearts, you know, and they begin to see the importance of this part of life. That public policy matters. When you talk of abortion, it's not a virtue, it's a vice. You know? And then you say things like, this would be impugning God's created order. So you can use you know, your own creative literature that you innovate on. You know? Absolutely. You can address what? homo sex. And you go to Madison, the sky's the limit. Or your capital, your, your state, the sky's the limit. Because it's so... There's uh, such depravity there that they really need someone to say, look, you know, this is all encroaching on the family. And you, right. That's a good, a good, if you're in the sessions, you can, you can learn a lot about what they're going to say to rebuttal your position that you have and your arguments. And uh, you can just talk about what right. God's law. And you learn, when it comes to this bill of abolition, you learn two things that are their biggest you know, biggest stumbling blocks or biggest objections. One is judicial, this by, by and far, judicial supremacy. They, and so we, very incrementally, every week we send them something. And we don't just take their um, legislative thing. If that's all they'll give us, their legislative email, we'll take it. And by the way, if you can't meet with the legislature themselves, make sure you're meeting with their chief of staff. That's very important because that's as good, almost as good, as meeting with the legislator himself. Um, so, um, what we do is get their personal, always remember this, it's easy for me as a pastor, because they're totally disarmed. And they're like, oh my gosh, a minister is sitting here. <laughs> so it's like, and so, I say, can I have your personal email? Oh yeah. And then a lot of times they give me their personal cell phone too. Because then I send out every week a little thing, it's very short piece by piece, teaching them these thoughts so that they see it's good, they see it's sound. And then, you know, showing them from the Word of God what their duty is, letting them know I'm praying for them. You know, and they know that's heartfelt and true. And um, it's, it needs to be done. It's, it's an important thing. And the church has, by and large, totally abandoned this area of civil government because of pietism. Yep. I just want to agree with you on that. In New York, we do the same thing. We have a legislative day once a year up there in Albany. And uh, we, we get all the churches groups go up and they meet with their legislators and, and you know, do the hot-button issues, you know. 
and uh, let them know, leave them paper with them on some of the things that we want changed and stuff. Yep. And uh, actually, it's been pretty good. Uh, I did one a few years back, and I talked with the legislator directly, and uh, I told him that, you know, New York City is a big boondoggle for New York. I mean, we ought to separate and make it a separate state. And uh, he actually wrote to the got a hold of news people and actually said we want we're thinking about check making New York City a separate state and it was a big issue for a while but it, I thought that was really good because the thing is they really are a anchor for the state mm-hmm. I mean uh, they're a boat anchor because they uh, you know they, all, they, they get all the prisons upstate you know it, and they're all downstate people you know mm-hmm. so we're taking care of them and, and it's like you know and then they uh, they, just, they steal all our money from the gas tax, you know, to build their bridges down there. I mean, and then they say, well, we're, big, we're a big advantage, you know, the city's a big advantage. Give me a break. Right. <laughs> no, I was talking about, with this brother earlier, he's writing a paper, he brought up prisons, and, you know, that's like an important thing, too. Um, the caging of men is so unbiblical and wrong, and God's way was so good, restitution or direct retribution. And they sell it as being more merciful, like what his, what's his name was saying last night, you know, the tender mercies of the wicked is cruel. It's not a good thing, it's a bad thing. And um, so there's so much to talk to the magistrates about and so much to be reformed within our culture. It's like, here's truth in the center, right? And have you ever seen a baseball? There's like this little rubber thing, at least there used to be when I was a kid in the center. There's like all this string around it. And that's like, all the crazy stuff man's created. <laughs> you know, so I'm 56 now, and it's like I feel like I've spent many years now just undoing all this string, you know, <laughs> trying to get back to how God intended things to be. And, you know, sometimes you wonder, um, yeah, so did I have any effect? Um, but that's all in God's hands, you know, so you do what you can the best you can. And um, the rest is in His hands. So it's good. When I was young, I thought, you know, oh man, I want to be so great. I want to be bigger than Billy Graham by the time I'm saved ten years from now. And I don't even like Billy Graham. I, mean, I don't. I don't like his. The, uh, I'm totally different from his theology now. <laughs> All that kind of stuff. And I realized, and God humbled me. He has an awesome way of doing that, laying us out cold, and breaking us. And um, for me, it was. I mean, I came to the point where I just laid down, prostrated myself on the ground and wept before him. Told him, if you kill me, I just only ask that you get glory out of it. And um, once you hit, you're more useful in his hands at that point. Humility is a good thing, you know. Boldness is important, but humility is important too um, for us to possess. So anyway... um, I hope to see some good before I die. I hope to see the preborn protected again by law before I die. Um, because it's such a great evil. And there's so many other wrongs in this culture and injustices and evils that are taking place that Christian men need to address. So I'm glad to hear that he was writing on this matter of men being caged. Because it's wrong. Totally against God's economy. Um, And maybe one day we'll see something awesome where that's even changed. The goodness of God was you were with the person you ripped off. (laughs) You know, you had a chance to be around good people and hopefully see a difference and change how you were living your life. Anyways, Jim's up here, so I'll let you. Thank you for your presentation and, and especially for everything that you're.